so I'm Kavita Krishnan and uh, I'm a Marxist feminist activist uh, in India. For 30 years, I belonged to the Communist Party of India, Marxist uh, Leninist. And uh, recently, I've had a break with that uh, a few months ago. And Ukraine uh, sort of was the, cat was the catalyst in that break. And I'll talk about that more presumably in the interview. Yeah, I'm promisedly from originally from Hong Kong. Um, I live in Los Angeles now in the U.S. Yeah, involved in various movements, but I think you know more recently part of a Hong Kong diaspora left wing group called Lao San Collective and engaged in various international solidarity work with movements in Hong Kong and also China occasionally and part of other groups, especially socialist groups in the U.S. like Solidarity and more recently Tempest Collective and also do some tenant organizing in Chinatown in Los Angeles and in various other movement spaces as well. And I'll just leave it at that for now. I'm Romy Kokransky. I'm the managing editor of the New Voice of Ukraine, one of Ukraine's only English language uh, newspapers. I've been a Marxist since I was 12 years old, and I've managed to kind of claw my way up the traditional media ladder. Uh, I also host a podcast called Ukraine Without Hype, which comes out around every two weeks, and we discuss uh, the biggest headlines of the week in Ukraine in English. The thing that kind of brings us all together, um, and we should say before kind of really, really starting that Romeo is obviously in Ukraine, so there might be some power outages. If there is, we'll just adapt, and hopefully there won't be. Um, I I had written a piece like, it feels like a century ago, but I think it was like only two years ago, called uh, The Periphery Has No Binaries. And the long, for Lausanne Collective, actually. And long, long story short, I won't get into it too much, but the main argument I was making is that what we can call multipolarity, I wasn't really thinking of that term back then, um, doesn't, it's, it's, it kind of feels like a luxury that a lot of folks, usually in the, some of the imperial cores, often in the West, but not just, as we'll get into it here, um, or who think, let's put it that way, who think in those binaries, uh, as we would call them, campism, like i.e. America equal imperialism, everything else uh, not. Let's get into it a bit more. And for those who don't know, obviously, uh, what is multipolarity? What is this thing that we're even talking about? It sounds quite fancy, but why is it a thing? Why is it a thing that still exists as a, as a concept that folks are actually, especially on the left, of course, are actually willing to defend? And why are we uh, challenging that? Uh, and we don't quite have an order of how to talk, so you can, we can just be civilized. <laughs> so you just like raise your hand, or you don't have to do that even. Just like go for a talk. If anyone interrupts anyone, we can just adapt from that. It's fine. Um, so I don't know who wants to go first on that, because I think everyone has something to say. I'll go ahead and, and go first, since everyone seems to be a little shy. <laughs> um. So this, uh, I think it's best to start with uh, a handy definition of multipolarity. Uh, so the, the, the way it's most commonly used is um, an evolution of the kind of uh, bipolar or kind of even unipolar world uh, where the United States, well, initially the United States and the Soviet Union were the two global hegemons. Um, they were the two global superpowers. After the fall of the Soviet Union, of course, that left just the United States. Um, but due to a combination of both the inexorable march of history and um, some poor mistakes by the U.S. government, uh, the U.S. state has seemingly lost some of this um, only or unipolar hegemonic status in the world. Um, especially following the uh, disastrous and immoral war on terror. Uh, as a result, other powers, notably China um, and Russia, of course, likes to consider itself part of this, began gaining um, some of the prominence that the U.S. once uh, solely held. And this is the concept we call multipolarity, or rather a world uh, defined by multiple imperial cores instead of just one. Um, one of the things that I like to point out, uh, as soon as anyone launches into a defense of multipolarity, after all, oh, isn't it better to have, um, multiple competing interests instead of one? Well, the, the thing is, there's still imperial cores. 
Uh, we're still talking about um, countries that want to be empires or that are empires currently uh, exerting influence on their neighbors and on their surroundings and on the globe as a whole. Uh, and when you break up that, um, when you break up that hegemonic control into several different parts, it just makes it that much harder to organize around and tackle because suddenly these different poles uh, can co-opt resistance. And this is what we see very often um, with uh, especially left-wing defenses of multipolarity is that these uh, separate imperial cores, not American imperial cores, can co-opt resistance to American imperialism and promote imperialism, simply not U.S. centric. So, in a nutshell, that's that's the the base concept of multipolarity here that we'll we'll be discussing. Yeah, I'll just briefly add. Uh, I think Romeo gave a, a really great summary of what multipolarity is, and and start off, um, start us off with a with a good argument, right? Um, I think one thing that's important to kind of note, right, is that. For multipolarity, um, or for how is is that this faith in multipolarity rests on this must understanding of how imperialism works globally, right? I think a lot of folks feel that um, you know, imperialism is mainly invested between uh, invested in the U.S. and the West um, as these uh, geopolitical actors that exert influence over these other countries, and completely ignoring the fact that you know global finance exists, right? International monetary and financial uh, other economic organs exist and we live actually in a world in which more and more nation states are being recruited um, as part of this kind of deepening um, phase of neoliberalism right in which more and more things are being privatized neoliberalized and this uh, and I'll say more I guess about this throughout um, the course of, of the podcast is that we're actually seeing, and I think there's a lot of um, research, and especially what some were calling new 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 state capitalism studies, right, um, and kind of Marxist political economy and other adjacent discourses, where we're looking actually at you know mid-sized and regional actors, right. Let's leave out China for now, right. Even talking about Brazil, South Africa, right, all these other nation states that that are you know not easily aligned to all these different powers or traditionally uh, in the last decade or so considers part of the BRICS blog, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, et cetera, as a seemingly kind of alternate power economic political bloc, right, to the U.S. and the West. But that's completely false, right? I think the, um, I think that's becoming more and more obvious that a lot of these states are being recruited um, and not, you know, as victims, right, of the IMF-led world order. But, um, you know, the national ruling elites for a lot of these countries, especially in the global south, right, are actually working completely in hand with the Western capitalist ruling class, right, um, and complicit in increasingly new ways to exploit the working class and other marginalized populations of the global south. And I think our task, right, as socialists, anarchists, uh, uh, leftists, progressives, is actually unearthed and find these interconnections between nation states, right, between different capitalist ruling class classes to see how they're finding new ways to exploit um, their own workers, right? And I feel like that's completely what's missing when we, um, you know, place our faith in multipolarity because um, by placing faith in multipolarity as it exists today, we're really only placing faith uh, on a certain, you know, new permutation of how global capitalism works, right? And um, I guess I'll, re I'll just stop there for now um, um, and maybe pass it to Kavita. So um, I think uh, after the really excellent uh, introductions to the you know, explanations of what the concept of multipolarity has meant all this while, what I'd like to add is um, and some observations about the way in which that term now has um taken on uh, meanings uh, that are not widely acknowledged at all. In fact, I would say that these are the dominant ways in which this term is now used. So I have been observing for some time that uh, in uh, Mr. Putin's and uh, you know, Xi Jinping's uh, articulation and uh, you know, on seeing that even the articulations of uh, the Modi, Modi regime in India and various other um, 
sort of uh, far right and authoritarian forces. Multipolarity has meant, okay, they say that, you know, we want a multipolar world, not a unipolar world. All right. What do they mean by that? They say that, you know, the universal standards or widely accepted standards of democracy and human rights are a Western imposition, that these are the unipolar sort of uh, imperialist imposition. And so uh, the fight for sovereignty and for anti-imperialism means a rejection of these universal standards. It basically means that every big power, and mind you, this doesn't mean, uh, you know, this doesn't apply to small countries. It applies to poles. Uh, so it doesn't apply to, you know, sections of people or nationalities or anything. It applies to the big powers. And it's to big powers and aspiring big powers, what they're saying is, you get to do what you please. And no one has the right to question you. You, you know, uh, you can define democracy as good governance. You can de define democracy as majoritarianism. You can define human rights as, uh, you know, happiness. You can do what you like. And uh, basically, no one should have the right to question you. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak more about that later. But I think that I just wanted to say that, you know, for the left, I think the idea of this polarity, this has always, this should have always been an alien discourse because this springs from realism, from the Kissinger school, you know. So I cannot understand when and how this became a part of left language. Uh, and uh, now the fact that the left uses this language completely shutting its ears to the fact that it has acquired a, a very dangerous meaning is something really alarming to me. And if I can just jump off of that, um, one of the things that I've noticed with this talk of multipolarity is what the states mean, Kavita, as you said, is basically they want to be able to do whatever they want and they don't want anyone to criticize them, right? And at the end of the day, that's what these states mean when they use this term. Um, but I've noticed in discourse, this gets melded into somehow rejecting Western influence or pushing back against uh, U.S. liberal capitalist values, uh, which, again, is, as you know, Kavita, completely destroys the universality of the values that we presumably all hold and are trying to build a world that uh, represents it. Um, and I think that melding, that confusion of, well, we have to reject everything that the United States does, and we want to commit atrocities against our populations without uh, hearing people complain about it. I think these two things get confused to the point where I've, I've seen um, multiple times people argue that uh, human rights are not a uh, leftist value or, or shouldn't be part of um, the conversation when we're talking about uh, building a, a progressive world because this is a Western concept, which again, is, is ridiculous. <laughs> as far as I understood, human rights uh, apply to humans and not a particular nationality or ethnic group. Um, but because of this confusion and its use and its promulgation by very well-known uh, fascists like Alexander Dugin in Russia um, has, has become, I think, one of the one of the scarier trends in the left um, in, in the past 10 years. Would we argue that confusion is a huge factor, if not maybe the main factor with all of this? Because I guess the main tension here, one of the main tensions that to various extents we've all noticed, either online or in your life or whatever, is a lot of folks who would be otherwise progressive defending reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights, you know, even maybe open borders, you know, they they would have different um progressive values. They would they would defend at home, quote unquote, in the US, in India, you know, in Europe, whatever. But as soon as you cross the border, so to speak, or you go to a certain part of the world that gets filtered through this binary, right, the campus binary, uh, if that's the right term for it here, well, they essentially adopt conservative politics, even far-right politics at times. It, it can get very 
and I'm using the word uh, schizophrenic. Obviously, this is not the accurate terms of it, but in popular parlance, this is how it can be understood. It can feel quite contradictory, right? Let's let's stick to that. Why do you think that is, or at least in your experience, at the very least, why do you think folks in your own context still have those? still adopt those binaries if they can't intellectually defend them, assuming that everyone does so. I'll say briefly that I think in my experience, especially organizing in the U.S., right, I think there's this kind of sense of guilt, right, being in the imperial core, being white, uh, being American, uh, whatever you call it, um, actually ends up overshadowing. So actually, you know, the, their kind of international analysis ends up being foreshadowed by this kind of politics of guilt and not actually grounded on listening to voices on the ground, right? And and beyond that, actually having a clear assessment of political economy, of how power works uh, in the international global arena, um, because, you know, uh, of this urge to want to uh, center this fact that, oh, people of the global south can govern themselves, and somehow this has turned into uh, this kind of faith and 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 frankly uncritical allegiance um, to these governments and identifying these governments and with with the people. I think another discourse I've heard right um, in recent years is that you know we can't call certain states or, or states in the global south authoritarian, even where they're clearly authoritarian, right? Because it, these are racist code works, things like that. I think you know I think that's a really interesting phenomenon um, where. West leftists, especially in the West, refuse to understand and refuse to see um, critical minorities, right? Especially leftists, their counterparts in these regions, who are actually doing the work to call these regimes out and to label these regimes for what they are, and 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 refusing to kind of acknowledge that, right? And and to you know place what they see as racist or what they see as um, 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 a position from the West over the voices of actual communists. Um, Marxist and other leftists on the ground, and I think the you know authoritarianism charge, and um, um, I think one thing that I tried kind of uh, touching on in my piece in Spectre is that what we see today. I mean, indeed, like I think the U.S. definitely weaponizes the discourse of uh, authoritarianism, right? Orientalizing states like China and other uh, other countries of global, global South um, as if the U.S. is some sort of perfect or imperfect democracy, liberal democracy over the values of, 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 you know, these crude authoritarianisms, which is, you know, obviously false, right? And I think, but actually the, you know, the way to kind of address this binary is not to simply side with the, the other part of this, um, uh, of this puzzle, right? But it's actually looking at the facts. And I tried to dwell a little bit more into this in the piece is that there's an uneven rise in authoritarianisms, right? And I think it's important to talk about authoritarianism uh, and its unevenness, especially in the last couple of years. Because right? I think to me, we can't reduce the rise of something like Trump, right, in imperfect liberal democracies to the phenomenon of Xi Jinping, uh, Putin, and et cetera, right? Bolsonaro is not the same as Trump, and Trump is not the same as Xi Jinping. And, you know, this might seem like semantics, or I'm, 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 I'm going into kind of uh, arguing over wordings, but I do think this is really important from a movement perspective, right? I don't think a lot of people in the West understand that it's nearly impossible, right, to build independent organizations at all, right, to fight on any arena of civil society in a public and open way when you get to countries like China, Russia, right, even Egypt, et cetera. And I think that's markedly different from the, the, the arena of struggle we have uh, in the U.S. and in certain European countries in the West, et cetera. And that is not to say that, you know, there are countries uh, in the West that are somehow better politically than some of these other ones, but to recognize, you know, the actually the actually existing uh, phenomenon of authoritarianism is diverse. It's uneven. It produces um, different kinds of far right movements, right, and regimes that require different tactics, right, different analyses. And there's no one size fit all model in terms of how we can address these different authoritarian actors. This is the real conversation we should be having, right, and. With the discourse of multipolarity, you know, it actually prevents us from adequately understanding, right, our political conditions in order to fight back capitalist authoritarian forces. Because, you know, a lot of leftists have chosen one side of the binary as opposed to actually understand the fact that, you know, authoritarianism is manifesting itself in different forms, right? And it requires 
different kinds of movements, right? Different kind of pluralistic movements in order to fight off these different threats. And that should be the starting point of conversation. And, you know, I think a lot of the left, especially in the West, are not even there, right? And I think that's part of the problem uh, when we center multipolarity as opposed to centering, you know, different, very diverse movements, right, that are resisting different state actors uh, on their own right. I can quickly add if that's okay. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, I'm, you know, we're talking with someone from Hong Kong and someone from Ukraine. So I sort of feel it's almost cruel to, to explore that. But this is what we see. We see this quite often. And yes, I mean, I, I mostly work in English and French. So I mostly, and Arabic. So I mostly see it around here, quote unquote, in this part of the world. In the Middle East, there is, or Middle East and North Africa or Swana or whatever terms you want to use. In the Arab majority world, there are certain tendencies that are very similar to this, but I feel like they come from a different position. There are, the sort of the conclusions are sometimes the same, although they, they often tend to kind of veer towards helplessness, hopelessness, cynicism, uh, maybe even like uh, apathy. So like not wholeheartedly endorsing Russia, but also saying like, you know, we don't have a dog in this fight or whatever, you know, those kind those kinds of arguments. And I feel like they come from a very specific positionality, usually from helplessness, because most of the Arab world is simply not democratic. And even the few examples that have some kind of democracy are extremely imperfect to put it very mildly lebanon tunisia and so on from your experience and uh, i think Kavita, you wanted to say something anyway but from your experience are there some interesting differences let's say between the indian left and the u.s left just because i have you two on here uh or the 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 hong kong left the chinese left for that matter and i don't know maybe the ukrainian left if from you wanted to entertain it that way like what are some certain uh or the russian left uh given that uh, russia is now invading ukraine what are, what are certain interesting similarities or and or differences between those different lefts if you want to put it that way that you can identify because i feel like it can help us if because if they reach the, the same conclusions at least like the same at the surface level th the fact that they may not have the same origins the same motivations may actually help us i think i hope tackle that right like actually deconstruct that in a way that that would make it less potent than uh, as much as we're seeing it today if that makes sense one thing which uh, I'd like to add, if that's okay, was that, um, you know, Promise was uh, very, uh, I think, very sharp in explaining why in America, in the USA, there is this um, sort of uh, guilt and hesitancy about, you know, the idea that we shouldn't be racist, we shouldn't uh, say the things that our government is saying and all of that. But I think that there is a different way in which we could look at the problem as a problem of the global left. Um, and while there are differences in position, I think that the basic fault line, you know, is the, the basic fallacy is actually something shared in common. And I'm going to try and uh, explain that. But first, I will say that, yes, you know, I've had to remind a lot of people who are talking about the problem, you know, that the West is making it all about itself. The left in America is making, you know, America is the uh, source of evil everywhere. And so that's it, you know, so because uh, it's coming from guilt and all of that. But that doesn't explain why it's almost worse in the global south. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, and the problem in the global south is that the left is not a tiny segment. Yes, it's a minority it has, you know, differential levels, different levels of uh, moderate electoral success. But in a country like India, it's still a pretty large, uh, it has a pretty large audience compared to that in most countries of the West. So it, the harm these kind of attitudes do is substantial. Because if you are one of the rare few consistent democratic voices in your country, then and you sort of legitimize the idea of uh, okay you know uh, these are lesser evils putin and g or whatever and you know we have to sort of pull our punches there you know okay we are with ukraine but you know we want ukraine to have its sovereignty but you know both ukraine and russia are bleeding and so there should be negotiations continuing the war only benefits america etc and this is the better, the better part of the left that I'm describing. There's also the other part which openly says, you know, oh, China and Russia's rise is excellent, you know, rah-rah, cheerleading for those countries. So um, 
so I, I think that the way in which I find it more useful to explain these things uh, is that there is a problem with the left losing its moorings in the sense that the left should have its moorings not in these, you know, in these, in these uh, formulas, in these, you know, macro formulas. The idea should be simple that you support struggles against the ruling classes anywhere or against oppressors anywhere. Why is that hard? Why does it have, you know, why would you uh, sort of measure out how much solidarity you give there and sort of give less solidarity against what you think of as an anti-US power? Why would you want, why would you invest even the little, you know, in the smallest, um, even to the smallest degree um, in the survival of, uh, you know, oppressive regimes uh, anywhere? of invade, you know, invading imperialisms anywhere. And I think what happens is that uh, one of the key reasons why this happens is this idea, it's almost like a George Bush style, you know, with us or against us. So the idea is I found in my experience here that even in good faith, I mean, the bad faith actors in India on the left are openly saying, oh, you're a CIA agent and so on and so forth. But if you, you know, minus those, and you look at the sort of uh, reasonably good faith uh, people on the left. So they kind of, you know, look very sad and regretful and say, you know, that what happens is that if you are critical or if you are saying that authoritarianism of the kind that you have in China, exactly what you were saying, promise, that there is no room for, there isn't that kind of room for uh, for uh, for um, struggle and for uh, movements. In India right now, it's hard. You get imprisoned for it, but it's still not as bad as it is in Russia or China. It's not gotten there yet. It might tomorrow. But that's exactly why we should learn from those uh, countries about how it has gotten there and how we can prevent it from getting there in India, right? Likewise in the US. But I think what they think is that if you are criticizing uh, these regimes, and especially China, then basically you are for liberal democracy, and if you are for liberal democracy, then you are just, you can't be on the left. You are not socialist. And I keep saying that, look, all of us in all our countries, in the struggles we wage, uh, are fighting to achieve rights, which we would call rights in the terms of liberal democracy. All those rights are not, they have been won by struggles. They haven't been given by some liberal regime. They've, many of them have been won by struggle, especially in India. Civil liberties is something the left has struggled for. And so, uh, you know, the idea that a socialist democracy, it's very simple that it should be, you know, whatever you call it, it whatever you're struggling for beyond this has to be better, more democratic than this. It cannot be that you destroy these achievements and then build socialism from anew. And I think that is where the problem comes. I don't have a simple answer because I know that in Marxist-Leninist terms, the idea is you don't build on the old state, you destroy the old state, and then you build a new and all of that. And I think that that is where, you know, the basic problem arises, that the idea that whatever democratic rights are won, democratic institutions are in place, the idea that somehow, you know, the minute you have a socialist revolution, anywhere. If you do, we are very far from that in everywhere in the world right now. But um, if you do, as we did in, you, you know, Russia or China or whatever, is that then, you know, whatever democratic rights there are, they all have to go down. You know, they don't count. You should not have them. Having them is bourgeois and all of that. And so, you know, you just, uh, you know, create something else and call it democracy. And to me, and I'll end here, to me, it's similar to the discussion in the in India, for instance, which prevailed for a long time and still does on the left, which is to say that feminism is bourgeois and that we are Marxists and that's good enough, you know. So feminism is bourgeois. And so uh, the idea is that, well, not really, you know. Uh, those are terms used at a time when the left, uh, Marxist feminism itself was a huge uh, nearly, you know, it was a competing force. And then they could say, okay, bourgeois feminism and ours, right? Marxist movement. But it's not like that anymore. And uh, the minute you say that feminism is bourgeois, what are you saying, essentially? What are you going to be struggling for, essentially? 
Um, so I think that that's, you know, uh, very poorly put, but I think that there is something basic here that is flawed. In, in fact, um, this behavior is something you can, I think one of, at least for me, one of the clearest examples of this, uh, of this kind of, um, very strange mindset, as you pointed out, Kavita, uh, is the the support of these authoritarian regimes by uh, people who identify as LGBT, um, people who are you know openly trans or um, openly homosexual, and then they'll turn around and say, "Well, uh, you know, China is." Um, doing this, it's better than the U.S., their COVID policy is better, they've eliminated home and homelessness and so on. And it's absurd because these are people that don't have rights <laughs> in most of the countries that they're praising. That, that the second they, they cross that border, um, there is a high chance they will be arrested if they are publicly... Um, if, if they are publicly acting in the way they act in the West. And it's like, you want to destroy your own rights? Like, what is, what, what, how do you imagine this happening? I'll just quickly add comments and then you can go. Uh, the argument, that, the, what you mentioned, Kavita, before, the whole, you know, feminism is bourgeois, we're Marxist and, that, and, and that's enough and whatnot. Uh, I definitely see resonances of that. I've experienced it in, in Lebanon, and I think I know that it's a, it's an issue in the wider Arab world, Arab majority world. Um, sometimes I would say stuff like, I, I mean, I know Palestinians, for example, Palestinian feminists have to deal with this um, among Palestinians. Like they say, like, you know, we'll deal with women's rights after our liberation from Israeli occupation. We'll deal with queer rights after that. And of course, the to, to paraphrase one of the songs, um, it's called in Arabic, just a dick home by DAM, D-A-M. The, the singer, like the, the main singer, basically said at some point, you, when you resist Israel, you threaten their Zionism. When I resist Israel, I also threaten their, in Arabic, it would sound like masculinity, i.e. the patriarchy. And it's the fact that those phenomenon actually work with one another. There is a reason why strong men are men. It's not like an accident of history. Of course, we can think of like a Thatcher or whatever, but they tend to be the exceptions. They also tend to function in different ways. Maloney. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Meloni, exactly now. And, you know, anyway, all of that to say that those arguments have always ended up serving the ruling class, the state, the oppressive state, uh, and, and so on. And it's kind of ironic, I think, at this point, and I'm not even sure if I got absurd, maybe that's the term I was looking for. Like, it's, it's really absurd at this point. And, you know, I was thinking, Romy, you mentioned like, uh, some folks even who are LGBTQ would, would make these arguments. I, I, I remember once it was a Twitter thread of someone who was arguing that one of the few truly trans friendly countries in the world is North Korea. And I found that incredible i really did and this was someone i don't remember the name but this was someone who's like someone like they're not even anonymous they were like a journalist in the u.s or whatever it was they have a profile and everything and i'm just using this as an example but these things we've seen them like we've really seen even in qatar like i i was baffled during the world cup the fifa world cup that there were some folks who were actually saying that like we cannot hold the same standards to judge qatar and its treatments of migrant workers and lgbtq rights and whatnot and those arguments were kind of perfectly aligned with openly like um homophobic uh, you know transphobic racist arguments being made by supporters of the qatar regime who are not on the left who would be con you know considered on the right and whatnot and what can what Obviously, the people who get erased, as we've, we've said here, are like queer Qataris or migrant workers in Qatar and, you know, all, all of those folks as if they don't exist, essentially. Romeo? I just, all, all I want to say what, uh, is that, in fact, the Qatari government, um, I believe a, a Qatari spokesperson, he was talking to a Western newspaper about um, human rights criticism of his government, and he literally said, like, his exact words <laughs> were you cannot judge us by your western standards we're a different civilization literally the exact same thing that these people are saying which is to my mind the farthest you can get from leftism as possible you are that is literally a, a reactionary value that you're upholding that there are these siloed civilizations of humans that are fundamentally different this is a fascist idea and the fact that it is repeated as some sort of a progressive like 
progressive ideology is obscene to be uh, honest. Sisi himself in Egypt has also said that and that has made difficult like very difficult uh, I think it's really weakened the campaign to support all of the Egyptian political prisoners as we've seen recently with the COP in Egypt and the course of Khiala and everyone else it's really made it difficult because I feel like that argument uh, and it is an argument obviously like that argument has I don't know if the term is hegemonic I'm not sure but it has become something that it that it's kind of like it's anchored in more like the universalism of human rights before for that with all of the flaws of universalism and whatever like has receded somewhat i feel and i can't help but feel like or or think that in one way or another this is also a way in which neoliberalism neoliberal thinking atomization has sort of been internalized and reified in in quote unquote our spaces yeah i just want to bri- yeah, briefly put on what you said i think yeah carrying on this discussion right this relationship between yeah, the left and, you know, these, you know, other progressive movements of marginalized ident- identities or LGBTQ movements, feminist movements, student movements, etc. Um, and also this notion of socialist democracy, right, which I think is a term that should just be more discussed, right? Not social democracy, but revolutionary socialist democracy, right? What does it mean to imagine socialism as a political system of a kind of governance, right? That isn't actually about a one party system, right? Isn't about you know, one enlightened, you know, vanguard, um, you know, kind of, you know, thrusting its ideals upon other and you know, putting its mold in other movements, but actually a socialist organization, socialist movement that respects the autonomy, right, of different marginalized struggles, right? And I think that's really interesting, right? Because I think going back to, I think what Kavito was saying about how we're actually not, you know, our goal here shouldn't be to abandon, right, at least some of the few and important advances, right, of, bourgeois democracy, it's actually to extend and maximize, right, these protections um, um, that are guaranteed under it, right, or not guaranteed, or the fact that bourgeois democracy actually doesn't guarantee these uh, democratic freedoms, right, we need socialist democracy and actually guarantee these freedoms. And I think this is actually really interesting for me to contrast, to bring it back to multipolarity, with the fact that, um, you know, the adherents of left-wing multipolarity, you know, accuse us of being, you know, bourgeois liberals and things like that. But in reality, their theoretical framework is actually banking on capitalism, right? It's, let's face it, right? Multipolarity is just capitalism, right? It's different. It's capitalism by different states. And to them, they think they can use the same logic that I just said. But to them, it's like, well, okay, these national capitalisms uh, are the good things, right? from bourgeois democracies. And these things are what we should be defending, right? Which is a completely perverse logic to me because you're not actually defending the best of, uh, or the good things that came up from bourgeois democracy. You're actually taking a step backwards, right? And going, you know, you're defending almost like vestiges of feudalism, of fascism, uh, of these kind of uh, perversity that comes, especially as we enter, enter late capitalism. And so I think it's just like a completely undialectical view of what we actually should be extending right? Uh, and what we should be focusing on as we think about the development of history, right? That, you know, and, and going back to my earlier point, right? I think what's important is, uh, you know, people, Western leftists, uh, an ability to see and to recognize the autonomy of marginalized struggles that don't neatly fit in the mold of national governance, right? Of state-centered governance in these capitalist regimes, because for them, uh, the agency of people of the global South can only uh, for some reason in their heads, right, be centered on capitalist uh, governance, right, and embodied in the form of a nation state. While in reality, there are all these different struggles going on that socialists in the global south should be also learning more um, about, right, how to relate to these movements, how to learn from them. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I just want to, yeah, I think just want to kind of touch on that talking point from these capitalists, right, that I've heard a lot is that, uh, you know, by, you know, um, by criticizing the governance of global south regimes we're actually saying that people of the global south can't run a country on their own but why is governance why is running a political system um reduced to that specific mode right of politics right why isn't mutual aid on the ground a type of governance a type of you know actual self-autonomy uh of self-activity of existing people on the ground right why isn't LGBTQ movements advocating for reforms, creating safe spaces, right, for their own student movements, feminist movements? They're actually challenging um, state power and these own rights. Why aren't these seen as rigorous uh, 
literal systems of governance, of ways of living, uh, and why why is that kind of privilege, so to speak, only reserved to uh, you know capitalist elites, ruling classes of these nation states that in reality you know uh, should be the locus of struggle of of which movements are always should be struggling against, right? Um, you know, I, I firmly believe that you know as a socialist Marxist, like whatever, whenever the revolution comes or something, movements must continue, right? Movements beyond the party, beyond any mass party or socialist organization must continue as a counterweight, right? To whatever, uh, you know, post-revolutionary system uh, can come to exist. And I think, you know, these are things that are completely not um, um, addressed or not centered when we center the, um, or focus on the rubric of multipolarity over learning from the existing struggles of people on the ground. I think that, yeah, I think, I mean, that's so, you know, uh, I found it really useful to think about, uh, you know, this uh, assumption on uh, the part of uh, the left, especially of progressive people in the uh, North, in the West, to think that we sh- we can't hold, uh, you know, the countries of the global South or other kind of, uh, you know, nations to the same standards, you know. And that that is somehow anti-racism. Uh, as someone who is part of struggles in the global south, I've been arguing for some time that it's in fact racist to not take us seriously, those people in these countries who want democracy, who want uh, you know rights, who want uh, uh, who are fighting against authoritarian tendencies. And I'll give you one example, which, um, you know, has uh, riled me a lot in recent years. Um, the ambassador to India of all countries, Germany, okay, he, uh, you know, was in Delhi and uh, he decided, uh, he's no longer the ambassador, he was the guy before this one. So he uh, made a visit uh, to the national headquarters in Nagpur of the main uh, fascist organization here, uh, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the RSS. The SS in that is not coincidental. This is an organization set up in the 1920s, quite directly um, inspired by the uh, move, fascist movements in Europe of the 1920s and 30s. So, uh, and th- this is not hidden because their foundational leader said so. They said we need to do with Muslims in India what uh, Germany has done with its uh, with its uh, you know Jews and all of that with its Semitic uh, people. So uh, the the point is he visited the office of this and that wasn't just it. He was photographed sort of you know paying homage to you know bowing down to offering flowers to a statue of one of these founders, the guy who's actually said Hitler's a good guy and we need to be like him. Okay. So I found this so appalling. And when he was questioned on that, his answer was very telling. He said, oh, RSS, this organization, is part of the mosaic that is India. Okay. And so, you know, I just went there to sort of understand. It's part of the mosaic of India. What does that say? That that is an orientalist understanding that this is mosaic. Are you going to say the KKK is part of the mosaic of America? Would you say that, uh, you know, some new, uh, uh, you know, a neo-Nazi kind of outfit anywhere, would you go around, uh, you know, visiting a neo-Nazi outfit in Germany and offering flowers there or shaking hands there even and saying it's part of the mosaic of Germany? You wouldn't. You are willing to say that in India because you are looking at India as some kind of, uh, you know, cultural space that is above politics that is civilizational and therefore cannot be uh, the same as our countries. That's racism. That's not anti-racism, you know. Um, And the other thing I just wanted to say is that when the left does this, my example shows that it's not just the left that does this, right? But when the left does it, when the left sort of, you know, thinks in the same way as the ambassador of Germany, what does that say? That says that basically, uh, you know, what what the left ends up doing often is to equate, uh, is to look at the states rather than as the people. So you're almost saying that the state equals people uh, in various circumstances. So you're not making that distinction uh, between a state and between what its people are struggling for. 
Um, and I see that example most uh, clearly, for instance, in Ukraine, where the left, you know, if you speak about Ukraine, they will say, oh, you know, Zelensky is this and that. He is bringing neoliberal uh, policies there and so on. Um, he's selling Ukraine to at Wall Street and so on. And I have two responses to that. The first I'm saying is uh, that, of course, you know, Zelensky is he is the elected. Uh, uh, he represents the government, an elected leader. And then there are people okay, who are not the same as a government first. But second, uh, and equally important, I think, is that, um, you know, it's up to the people of Ukraine to decide what struggles they're going to prioritize when, right? Uh, what Zelensky is doing in the economy is nothing uh, exceptional. It's what the government of India is doing. It's what so many governments all over the world are doing. And I'm sure there are critics of it in Ukraine. But, uh, you know, the workers of Ukraine may be fighting against, uh, you know, sort of uh, draconian labor laws now or the withdrawal of labor laws now. But they are also going to be the same workers fighting in, uh, you know, maybe the Ukrainian army against an invasion. If the country survives, then, of course, there'll be room for all these other struggles. So I find it really strange when the left starts, you know, doing this kind of uh, flattening out. Um, and uh, because that also, I think, is... Uh, you know, exactly what the left uh, should have been struggling against, because the left is usually a smaller tendency in a country. And if your government has to be equated with you, uh, what is, uh, <laughs> what, where do, where do, where are you going to stand then? You want people to be listening to you, to be listening to others in the struggle, rather than taking the word of your government for what you represent, right? That's exactly right. And, and it is racist. Um, I mean, as, as a Ukrainian, um, and I'm, I'm not even talking about being subjected to, oh, all the Ukrainians are Nazis. Um, but it is this dismissal of the experience of Ukrainian leftists uh, that we, like, agree with the uh, liberal, democratic, the bourgeois, EU EUification of our country, um, that everyone's on board, everyone in Ukraine wants the same thing. Um that's uh, like obviously that's false obviously that's false anyone who's ever met a single other human in their life should know that you put three humans in a room and you'll get 10 opinions uh, like humans are we are a um naturally um quarreling and bickering bunch uh and in ukraine that is exactly there was an op-ed i published just the other day about ukraine's a particular love of bickering. We will argue and bicker over things that we even agree on. And especially when it comes to um, Zelensky's economic politics, the only reason you don't see more pushback and part of the reason why this is going on is because we are in a war. And in fact, I have many comrades who are currently fighting on the front lines in Bakhmut, in Solidar, um, and the reason they're doing that instead of like protesting labor all is because if the country does not exist, all of these arguments would be not Russia wants to genocide us. They want to kill us all. So it, it is kind of uh, not not really the priority right now to go out and, and protest against um, the, the uh, reduction in labor protections that we've been afforded uh, because we're currently trying to avoid being genocided. Uh, people who are dead cannot argue um, for their rights, as authoritarians around the world have learned, um, which is why they like to use genocide so often. So this is absolutely something I've um, seen and been subjected to, is this uh, belief that, or, or this kind of shorthand of a uh, nation state for the people that live in it. Um, and as you said, Kavita, it is incomprehensible because a large part, most of the progress that we've made as a left have been uh, via non-state resistance to government policy, um, especially in the United States. That's the majority of labor rights. Um, that's the majority of LGBT rights. All of that has specifically been won um, by uh non state non government movements um explicitly resisting what the state is trying to do uh and and when you remove the the 
intellectual space for that to occur, you are pretty much consigning entire swaths of people as unworthy of the rights you hold. And this is, um, and mostly this is true for Western leftists. It's basically saying, oh, you're Indian, you're Chinese, um, you're Palestinian, you just don't deserve the same rights we have. Um, have fun living under your authoritarian overlords and be happy about it. Be grateful that you have your authoritarian overlords because the the downside is you could be occupied by the U.S. Despite the fact that, well, repression is repression regardless of whose boot is on your neck. Um, so I think when we're talking about the fetishization of the state, one of the things that often ends up happening is dividing the world like i literally think of it as you know that board game risk like dividing the world into spheres of influence and that term has been used by folks on the left i'm, I'm spacing out on a few names now but like some british leftists for example have literally said that like we in in the con in the contest between america and russia in ukraine which is how they would frame it we have to be sensitive to Russian demands or Russia, Russia's historical association with the Ukraine or, you know, whatever, Russia's fear of influence, right? And obviously what that does, I mean, I think we've all said it in one way or another, but what that does is that it literally says that someone from Hong Kong who identifies as a Hong Konger cannot be, you know, cannot have that identity. This is an identity that doesn't fit our world worldview and therefore it cannot exist. Ukrainian to some extent as well. And I find that quite... As I said, I think it comes from a very real politique, very uh, conservative, even isolationist to some extent, worldview. It's like, you know, socialism for me, fascism for you, or like democracy for me, a fascism for you, or what, what have you. And it's bizarre. It's really bizarre. Like, I'm thinking this is a bit facetious and a bit ridiculous, but I was watching yesterday an episode of Seinfeld, and at some point they were playing Risk. Just That's why I thought of Risk. And actually, in that episode, uh, the Ukraine, as they would call it back then, uh, was brought up, and Seinfeld, uh, not Seinfeld, Kramer said, um, you know, the Ukraine is weak. And then there was a Ukrainian on the train in a very uh, uh, stereotypically Slavic way, as they would portray them in Hollywood, basically destroys his Risk board, which I found actually quite metaphorical metaphorically funny given what's happening now but it's a thing like it's a tendency that's very common and you know I, you go back 30 years 40 years 50 years is it still a hiccup from the cold war like is it just a reification a recycling essentially of that sort of binary but instead of two we now have four or five or six or is there something else happening because i think one let me phrase it this way is there any class analysis in that sort of framework and if there isn't class analysis, what makes it left? I don't think class is the only thing. I'm, I'm against class reductionism. You know, we should be intersectional and whatnot. But if there isn't class, what does that make that? I think one, uh, yeah, as a direct response to that, I think one art argument, just to go through a few arguments from, you know, so to speak, right, the best, uh, the good faith, or as good faith as possible, defenders of most people have heard, is that, no, it's not that, socialism or whatever condition socialism is somehow kind of crystallized in these nation states. It's that by, uh, I'm just rehearsing the argument here, that having more nation states collide with each other and not just having U.S. as a single dominant power opens up the conditions for revolutionary struggle more, right? Because then all these different imperialists will have less power, and so there's actually more room for progressive movements to come up, right? And I think, Romy, your, your kind of first thing already you know, is already, a, you know, clearly attacking through the logic of some of this, right? And, you know, the other ridiculous thing I've, I've heard is that they justify this logic by saying, like, look, look at all these decolonization movements after the World War II. Like, you know, World War II, because of all these imperialist clashing, he's trying to open up space for these decolonization, anti-colonial movements to emerge. Like, did you forget about the World War II? <laughs> you know, like, I don't, like, do you not understand what happened in those wars? Like, I think there were movements, yes, class-based workers' movements that took advantage of what they can, right, in order to restore and try to promote anti-colonial change. But, but it's, it's, it's completely ridiculous, right, to say that we should be calling for the conditions of something like World War II again so that, right, it could somehow unlock the potential for decolonization. No, we should, as leftists, we emphasize, right, we stand behind decolonization, anti-colonial movements not to call for a multipolar world in order to somehow unlock those struggles, right? That's purely, you know, going back to, I think, what Kivya was saying, a world of formulas and dogmas, right? That actually leads us further into destruction rather than somehow unlocking 
space for these movements. And, you know, another thing, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to flag this example just because this is recently the news, but Lula's victory in Brazil, right? Who is another, per, Lula is another person who was, you know, really flagging this whole multipolar thing. You know, obviously, yeah, you know, the, the PT beating Bolsonaro is good. Like, that's great. I'm, I'm glad Bolsonaro didn't win, right? And I'm sure there are a lot of progressive reforms under Lula's regime, of course, and his past regime, not so much, right? And we'll have yet to see, you know, what, what, what type of administration he'll have with his, you know, very broad coalition. But that's all to say what's happening in Brazil, the victories in Brazil, whatever, Chile, whatever you can call it, does not automatically translate to what's happening in movements in China, right? In Iran, right? In Russia, where the anti-war feminist movements, workers' movements are being crushed, right? And when we talk about multipolarity, we can't just be like, well, look at Lula, look at Brazil, right? Literally the point of multipolarity, right? I'm literally thinking in the same terms as them now, is that you have to think of all the polls together, right? You can't just consider, say, oh, that poll's doing well. What about Chinese movements? Well, Iranian movements, Russian movements, Ukrainian movements. You can't just ignore that, right? That's just bad faith analysis. And I think that's another kind of argument uh, I, I would kind of make too, um, is that, you know, we need a balance sheet as socialists, as Marxists, right? We can't just bank on the victories that we like and ignore the other ones, right? Because this is the model you're promoting. You're saying that multipolarity, having different polls, somehow strengthens movements throughout the world, right? And empirically speaking, that is not true. What is happening is that you guys are just focusing on the movements and victories you like, right? while ignoring the movements that are struggling, right? That are being crushed, that are inconvenient for your narrative. So that's, uh, I'll, I'll end on that point and pass it on to. Um, you know, one thing I was thinking, uh, just listening to Promise, and uh, I think that is, uh, you know, what, what he said just made me think about this, that, um, you know, for the left, this is a strange kind of choice to, uh, you know, to, to, to present it as a choice, to present our choices in terms of international positioning as one of either choosing multipolarity or then being with unipolarity. So, um, I think that is itself a, a false, a bad faith uh, way of putting it. Why? Uh, I was just thinking about this. Let's see, uh, U.S. imperialism, okay? So whenever America acts um, imperially in any way, so okay, it's, of course it's to do with invasions, but there are uh, other ways as well. There's the pushing of economic policies. There's all kinds of economic arm twisting, et cetera, et cetera, all of that. You know, for instance, in India, if, you know, through the WTO or whatever, if you're going to force uh, privatization of education or, you know, farm laws of a certain corporate kind, or whatever it is, you would support people fighting against that. So you want those who are fighting against American imperialism to win. Now, why, you know, unless you make, uh, unless you think that these regimes of Russia or China or whatever are basically being uh, attacked by American imperialism and therefore you need them to survive and fight, uh, why on earth would you have any degree of investment in their survival? Okay, Iran included, by the way, because in India there are sections of the left that will be absolutely silent on Iran or the movement in Iran right now, because basically, you know, um, what happens if uh, the movement achieves its goals and gets rid of the Islamic Republic? So, um, uh, you know, that would be regime change. Um, so I think that, you know, the understanding that being with victims of imperialism, and then you have to be with victims of all imperialism, because then what is Ukraine? Ukraine is a long-term victim, a colonial victim of uh, greater Russian uh, imperialism, and it continues to be uh, today. And it, that's what it's fighting. So you want them to win. Simple, you know. So for the left, I think the uh, the assumption of uh, this kind of choice means that you then uh, relieve yourself of the uh, responsibility to stand, you know, to to do, you know, to stand in meaningful solidarity with uh, those struggling. So, you know, with the organization I just parted with, let me give you an example. So what they say is, you know, they're not the, you know, the obvious uh, kind who say, oh, Putin is wonderful and Ukraine is racist and Nazi or whatever. No. But then what they say is, how, oh, but Kavita, you know, what other position can we take? We've all, already said we stand with Ukraine. So I said, but that is a formal position 
which you're backing with an analysis that says that Russia and Ukraine are bleeding while the war is benefiting America, so the war should end, and so that we want peace. How is peace going to be achieved? Through negotiations. And what are negotiations going to mean? You won't say anything about that, but basically it means Ukraine giving up a uh, whole swaths of territory and its people. What happens to its people, right? So that, and what would meaningful solidarity look like? It would look like, uh, what do you do in terms of meaningful solidarity with Palestine, for instance? Because my comrades would also ask, what can we do beyond just, you know, issuing a statement? Well, what do we do in terms of Palestine? We uh, basically campaign to tell people uh, information about what's happening there. And we, you know, target, we campaign against disinformation, against uh, what is said, uh, you know, in terms of Israeli propaganda and all of that. So, you know, you do that in active terms. So uh, why would you not do that about Ukraine? You know, the whole public sphere, this is not just the left, uh, which is another thing I say that, you know, the left, uh, this isn't an issue just about a, a debate inside the left. If you look at India, then the entire public sphere is uh, is absolutely uh, saturated with Russian propaganda. That is, uh, you know, not just on the far right and the left, but, uh, you know, people who are victims of the far right in India, above all, for instance, the Muslim community, the idea is that America is, you know, killing Muslims. So they don't know that Putin, you know, how many Muslims Putin has killed or displaced or whatever. No clue at all. So, you know, the idea would be that the left has a real job here of countering this misinformation and, uh, you know, filling it with uh, ways in which we can actually help. And one of the big ways is uh, to counter, you know, to do the war, in, uh, the information war in India on behalf of Ukraine. Um, and one last thing, you know, what we were saying earlier, because I didn't want to lose that thought, was that, you know, what you were saying about this idea of civilizational you know, values. And so, okay, Western civilizational values, and, you know, you can't impose the same standards on Qatar or India or whatever. Um, that also is exactly what these fascist uh, multipolarists are saying right now. That's what they mean by multipolarity, that unipolarity means universal values. Um, and multipolarity means that you can't impose your ideas of equality on us. And in fact, your values of equality are an elite, uh, elite imposition, even in your own country. And so, you know, uh, there are movements against that imposition, which are wonderful movements in your country. And uh, likewise, you know, so that's exactly uh, what worries me, that when the left thinks in these terms, they don't realize that they are saying exactly in what not just the far right in Qatar says, but what the far right across the world says, you know. This is, uh, like, when you look at India, uh, the Indian example, um, one of the RSS's big things has been um, pushing and promoting the idea that uh, caste is uh, something that is foundational or even fundamental to Indian society. And you would never have a leftist that openly agrees and says, yes, castes are good, we should we should promote this. But that is, in essence, what... The what you are saying, if you are leftist, that says, "Oh, we should have a uh, multiplural world. We should support uh, the global South or uh, non-U.S. Um, hegemons against the U.S." What you are, in effect, saying, um, at least in in the case of India, is you're saying, "I think caste uh, caste is good, and we should have a caste-based society in India." That is that in for Russia, you, what you're saying is. Uh, I believe that we should uh, kill all LGBT people. For China, you're saying I believe uh, everyone should be Han and speak Man and speak Mandarin, and there shouldn't be any dialects or anything. When you look at the actual results, the the practical me uh, meaning implied by supporting this concept of a multipolar world, it turns out you're just supporting fascism. You're just supporting every single. Uh, fascist policy that every single fascist regime is trying to impose on their own populations. Um, and from that perspective, it becomes obviously absurd uh, to to even imagine that this can somehow be a progressive or uh, a progressive idea or create space for um, decolonial and, and uh, socialist movements because how does promoting fascist policy 
open space for Marxism. I'm, I, I, I've never been too clear on that. Um, in the case of Ukraine, actually, and Gavita, this is something I, I really wanted to bring up because this is, um, I, I watched, uh, some interviews that, that, that you had done previously, um, talking about Ukraine. And, uh, I expressed this in, in, uh, to Joey already, but, um, when the, the war started, uh, journalists and media personalities in Ukraine, um, we were basically deluged by media crests, uh, from India. And in the beginning, we were very happy to do them. Uh, obviously, the war is just starting. We needed to start um, making sure the Ukrainian narrative has space, that it's that the, the information space is not um, immediately dominated completely by Russian propaganda. Uh, so, so we started talking to these Indian media outlets. And we very quickly realized that um, not only were the Indians... Uh, or at least uh, the Indian media that spoke to us was was not interested in interrogating um, the kind of causes behind this conflict of, of uh, critically analyzing why um, the the full scale invasion occurred and how Ukraine um, is a, a victim of uh, imperialist aggression for hundreds of years, uh, but instead it just wanted to. Uh, have the the picture of a Ukrainian and a Russian screaming at each other. Uh, and as Ukrainians, we are not, like, we, we were not interested in that. We very quickly, there's been basically an unspoken agreement with every single media personality in Ukraine, every single journalist. We don't talk to Indian um, stations at all. And we see that their information space is just critically repeats Russian propaganda, Russian claims, and without any analysis, and if there is a Ukrainian counterpoint, it's not presented in a way um, that uh, centers Ukraine as a victim of aggression. It's simply placed as a, oh, well, this person disagrees, which brings uh, inequality to this conflict, which does not exist. Um, Russia and Ukraine are not equal subjects in the mysterious war that has just appeared. And, and that's one of the things I've noticed a lot, um, and not only in leftist discourse, but um, primarily in, in, in leftist, uh, or at least for me, primarily in leftist spaces, this idea that war descended. It came out of nowhere. There was no war, and then the cloud of war, like a, a thunderstorm or a hurricane, lowered onto Ukrainian territory. That's not, war is not weather. War is not the um, mysterious uh, reverberations of the aether or anything like that. It is a specific action taken by humans against other humans. Uh, and by kind of saying, oh, Ukraine is bleeding, Russia is bleeding. Russia isn't bleeding. Russia attacked. <laughs> Russia invaded. What do you mean Russia is bleeding? They can stop bleeding by leaving us and not, sh and not shooting us. Then we don't have a reason to shoot them. <laughs> it's, it's very simple. Uh, and it, it, it drives me insane this, this way, uh, this, the, the, the way people treat war as some kind of atmospheric disturbance instead of concerted human action. Um, and this applies to uh, quite quite a number of other things I've noticed in the wider world as well, beyond war, um, LGBT oppression, religious oppression. These are all, all very often presented as things that are unavoidable or a consequence of nature instead of human agency, uh, because people apparently don't have agency. I, I don't know what I, I don't know how this i like how the these beliefs on the left propagate or how they maintain coherency because as i've just shown on the, on the slightest on the slightest analysis it it becomes prima facie absurd no just because uh, what uh, romeo mentioned about india i just wanted to quickly come in uh, first about the television um yeah it's not just you guys I have stopped, and several others like me, have stopped going to Indian uh, mainstream television since 2015. Uh, because, yes, uh, this is exactly what you describe is not just about Ukraine and Russia. We, what they want is someone who is, uh, you know, Muslim and Hindu, uh, Muslim and hateful Hindu, 
or, uh, you know, uh, somebody who is uh, anti-Modi and someone who is pro-Modi screaming at each other, with the anchor uh, basically sitting in judgment and uh, periodically turning the uh, bad guy silent, which means, you know, and the bad guy is us, basically, silent and, you know, lecturing them. So that's, of course, not new. But the other small thing about caste that you mentioned, you know, that is uh, so central because um, I was uh, completely taken aback to see that uh, when I began reading uh, Dugin, I found that Dugin quite centrally, repeatedly says uh, that anti-hierarchy ideology is something we need to dislodge. Uh, and uh, in, the, in those words, he uses the terms of the caste system of India. He quotes uh, other like previous fascists like um, Julius Evola to say that we are today, the world is in what is called Kali Yuga. And Kali Yuga in, in, in uh, Hindu terms means the, uh, a cat, you know, a catastrophic overturning of the correct hierarchies of the good order of society, where the oppressed castes rule, where women are on top and it's linked because where women are free to marry across castes, where there's a mixing of castes, there's a specific word for that, mixing of castes, like mixing of races, uh, essentially that's the catastrophe. And he uses that term. And I uh, kept trying to tell people in India, how can you not be interested in this? How can you not bother that what is part of Indian uh, fascist uh, language uh, is now being incorporated into a global fascist language, the kind that Steve Bannon listens to, uh, the kind that, um, you know, others in between Dugin and Steve Bannon are listening to and using. Exactly. Uh, thanks for that, Kavita. I, I still, I kind of have two main points I want, I want us to get into, so we'll see how to get into them. Uh, but I'll pin this for now. So what I wanted to say is that the, you mentioned, I forgot who it was, but I mentioned the word regime change. And I, I, I've been finding that very interesting, the discourse around that term, because w what is a revolution? You know, like the Haitian French revolution were regime changes, like the kind of, assumed to be, uh, you know, the Russian Revolution 1917 was a regime change. The Arab Spring's main slogan was the people want the downfall of the regime, Shabiri, the Scot, and Nizam. And this was not meant metaphorically, you know, like the... When I used to engage with these bad faith arguments on the internet, and I, I try not to anymore, but it was really as if, like, I don't know how to say this, but when people took down to the streets in Egypt, Tunisia, Bahrain, Syria, Iraq, uh, what have you, and now in Iran more recently, of course, but that's a different context, what they're calling for when they say we want the downfall of the regime, or in Iran, they're literally saying death to the dictator. It, this is not metaphorical. They're not saying this as a figure of speech. They're saying death to the dictator. They're saying regime change. They're saying the current regime needs to go. When I hear, like, even the, the, the hesitancy I, I've seen, and I think we've all seen it, when, like, Ukrainians say that, what well, Putin has to go. Like, this is, can, he cannot stay. The hesitancy is, is palpable, right? Like, or even the silences are quite palpable because it's almost like if, if he goes, it's like our worldview cannot be sustained. As it's, this is what I'm trying to get at is that there is, there seems to be the sense of fragility. The current world order already feels fragile. Uh, obviously, you have climate-related fears and anxieties of things just falling apart and catastrophes and whatnot. And it, it's as if at least part of the story, and this is like a generous reading of it, obviously, because as I said, there are some good faith folks who sort of end up concluding that way without being entirely cognizant, maybe, or like aware of, of the consequences of what they're saying, essentially. It's almost like we need some stability, right? Like we need things to stop spinning or we need things to slow down or, or whatever. And this ends up kind of feeding because like if we think of the hong kong protests right one thing that has really stopped happening for the most part is hong kong being in the news since 2019 after the crushing obviously and when hong kong was in the news when hong kong was part of quote unquote the discourse or whatever you could have all of those debates and whatnot which largely meant like hong kongers being silenced really and then when that you know, it's all over. Well, that's done. And we, we, that we can stop thinking about it because, well, China has won or nothing is happening now in Hong Kong. And this, this idea of nothing is happening because the state has succeeded or has temporarily succeeded for that matter is a very dangerous one. And it's, uh, that's why I'm saying that I don't quite understand what makes this even. I know that we, we use the term left wing and we use left and leftist and whatnot because we also need to 
to be kind of discursively coherent and because we are making like specific differences between that a left is saying that and a far right person saying that or like a non quote unquote non political person saying that there are different reasons but if the conclusions are the same how maybe I'm kind of trapping myself here because it's going to be a big question but it's kind of difficult to to tackle it in with a one one size fits all and that's why I kind of appreciate this conversation because we've seen I think in our different examples that we've been giving and the experiences that we've had that the 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 incentives may not be the same the origins may not be the same even if the consequences are the same or even if the final conclusion is the same and so for that for us to be able to be able to tackle all of that we need to sort of recognize it i guess and okay so i had as i said i wanted kind of two main points we can get into a couple of things one i'm very interested in in hearing your thoughts what do you see um the role of the diasporas in all of this. We've seen, and let me preface that by saying that we've seen the Palestinian diaspora, for example, for the most part, when it is active, of course, you have folks who are not active, politically active, when it is active, sort of organizes around the question of Palestine and of the occupation and and colonization and apartheid and all of that. And it tends to be very um, reactive in the sense of uh, when Israel is, you know, launching bombing campaigns or assassinating journalists or all of that, then maybe they take to the streets or maybe they protest and whatnot. So it's reacting to current events, right? The Indian diaspora that I've become familiar with in the UK and the US, a lot of them have sort of gone to the right, right? And far right and are BGP nationalists and all of that. We've seen this with Trump's association with with the BJP and with the Indian diaspora in the US. Where do you see, how do you sort of uh, reconcile with the role of the diaspora? Uh, In my case, I am now part of the diaspora, promise you are as well. Where do you see those dynamics fit in, in the conversation we've been having? Yeah, I guess I guess let's say a bit about the Aspreth stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, just you know, a very clear reason why um, Hong Kong and Chinese diaspora, you know, Taiwanese diaspora, et cetera, important. Actually, well, yeah, maybe more Hong Kong and and and, and Chinese and you know Tibetan and, and Uyghur um, and other you know diasporas from the that Xinjiang region, quote unquote, um, is important because we just people just can't do things, right? We can't organize independently, openly, publicly, really, that much anymore. And Hong Kong's a new site, a uh, new victim of that, right? Um, you know, people are entering a new stage of trying to, rec- like, just understand what it means to be in this new stage where, you know, any little minor protest or dissent you express online or, or whatever, I mean, not even on the streets anymore, right, could trigger national security laws and stuff like that. So all that means that diaspora is a very important site for organizing, for rebuilding an oppositional mo- movement, right? And thinking in terms of the left, right? This is actually where, uh, and this is what I always try to explain, and it's really hard to explain, I think, to people that I think China, especially Chinese government, has uniquely, um, has very unique experience in terms of silencing independent movements. They've been in a position, right, where they were a rising kind of anti-colonial, whatever, worker, uh, worker center movement, and they know exactly what it means to um, to to suppress that, right? And I think since Tiananmen, they've become very very smart in terms of doing that very well with minimal public bloodshed, right? So that they take out very strategically, right? Organizers and labor struggles, whatever. Just you know, silence is a couple of people. You don't need like mass killings like Iran or Russia and things like that. You just need to do just enough so that there is not a movement. And I think I don't think people understand how how like effective it is uh, it has been in doing that and so the kind of idea of an independent movement oriented left right has really died out for generations right but it's contained into very small minorities people don't even know what it means to be in the left in that sense right if you say left in hong kong it's usually people think you mean like the government right so it's like there's just like discursively there's like a lot there's like a lot of stuff you have to kind of like dig through because for for people it's just liberalism and and you know communism which is authoritarianism and diaspora actually becomes an important space right where people especially from china and from hong kong get exposed to different struggles right and one really important example that's kind of brewing is for example chinese international students participation in the recent strikes uh labor strikes in the university of california system which is uh you know the largest uh, higher ed i think strike in his in u.s history um you know, what does it mean for, you know, these poll students to be exposed to new kinds of movement traditions, right? Exposed to new communities of struggle. How does that reshape their own political consciousness? And what can these people bring back, 
And so I think these are questions I think the diaspora should, uh, uh, can be thinking about. And this provides the groundwork for us to start thinking about how to, um, and going back to the problem of action, right? I think, uh, uh, what Kavidi was saying just now in terms of comrades asking, okay, but what we, what can we do actually about Ukraine or Russia and things like that? You know, people ask the same stuff about China, right? It's like, oh, we're, you know, we can't do anything because xenophobia and U.S. China tensions. Like, you know, what, what can you suggest? Like, what can we actually do? You know, too much actually suggests a bunch of stuff that people like to ignore. But, you know, and some of these things include actually looking at the intersections of national capitals, right? Where does U.S. and Chinese capital intersect? Again, very concrete example. Um, if we dig into the research, um, some of the, uh, you know, high rise, super gentrifying housing development projects in places like Brooklyn and New York are actually bankrolled by loans by Chinese state capital, right? So then I, I go into a little bit of this, I think, in the Spectre article too. So that's a concrete site of intervention, right? This is uh, this is where, where literally Chinese and U.S. capital developers, Chinese banks, whatever, actually come into contact. And there's nothing abstract or whatever about it, right? This is actually a concrete movement to build people around, right? To energize diaspora communities, which are often not very left-wing, into the left, right? To bridge those struggles with left-wing struggles, with anti-gentrification struggles. And again, another example is like the Chinese international student strike, right? What does it mean to think about, you know, the intersections of these different struggles so that, you know, we can actually, I think the usual response to this is that, well, you, you know, third campers, anarchists, Trotskyists, whatever, you guys are, you know, saying all these things that, you know, aren't very realistic, right? But I guess what we're trying to say is, no, in order to actually fight capitalism, right, in its totality, in its many interconnections, we actually do need to look at these interconnections such that neither Washington or Beijing or whatever is not just unrealistic or idealistic. It's actually the most practical way to fight capitalism, right, to fight multipolar imperialism and capitalism, is that we need to link these struggles together. and. The truth is we're always linking struggles together, right? This is just an excuse, right? Whenever we do organizing, right? It's not like, oh, okay, let's, we're only going to talk about race here and not housing. Like we never do that, right? So why can't we do the same when it comes to different nation states, right? Intersecting together, different capitalist classes intersecting together. And again, I think the diaspora here has a very critical role in terms of bridging all of these things, right? And taking not only new political traditions back home to re-energize things, but to continue the struggle abroad, because, you know, again, one good thing, quote unquote, about globalization is that now, you know, Chinese state power, for example, right, isn't just contained within the mainland, right? It's about its investments abroad, right? And it's about, you know, the fact that it draws its power from all these different sites abroad. And this, these are concrete opportunities to put, you know, Chinese diaspora in conversation with indigenous people fighting Chinese, uh, you know, funded agribusinesses in Brazil and the Amazon. Right. It's like you're the explosion of possibilities, right? That aren't abstract, right? It's in fact very highly concrete. And again, we go back to the original point, the diaspora actually becomes the key, uh, key motor in making uh, bridging these connections together. And if I can just um take the the next slot, because uh, I feel uh, I, I grew up in kind of the both the, the South Asian diaspora community in the US as well as um kind of the post-Soviet or Ukrainian diaspora communities. And a lot of these, um, a lot of these tendencies I've seen develop throughout my lifetime. Um, especially Joey, as you mentioned how a, a lot of the Indian diaspora communities are, um, uh, well, we can call them conservative. I suppose, uh, supposed to be polite. Um, at the very least they, they, you know, push forward candidates that have been endorsed by the PJP, um, they very often attend temples which are funded um, by the uh, BJP or RSS. Um, and, and this is, I think historically, uh, there has been, of course, the trend of um, migrant communities becoming more conservative as their status in um, their, uh, as their status in the, their um, new country solidifies as they gain more um, social acceptance, um, they often start ossifying and uh, barring the way to other immigrants, um, which will necessarily push them right. Um, for the Desi community in, in particular, what I've seen is um, these 
uh, especially the BJP and, and not just the BJP, but there's kind of a whole homegrown industry of, I don't know, Hindu con men <laughs> to be very unpolite about it of these like gurus and spiritual guys who come over and they see money making opportunities because one of the biggest things that, um, migrant communities, uh, abroad face is that they, they have homesickness. It's basically you're alienated from your home um, nation. The food is different. The money is different. Did our power go out? Our power went out. Oh, can't hear him anymore. Let me text him quickly. Ah, my power just went out right now. Yep, that actually happened. Okay. Uh, let's. Um, yeah, we said at the beginning of the introduction that this might uh, the episode that this might happen. Uh, let's see what what we're going to do. It's okay. We, I wanted the last point sort of um, was going to be like a there is this argument right on the left of it kind of feel it feels practical at first even even when it's not uh, which is to say like you know yeah I you know again it's the whole we can deal with this later uh, we can deal with this criticism later we can deal with this weakness critique and whatnot later after liberation what that means uh, whatever that means and obviously what what we see in the, i don't i don't argue, i don't believe in this myself i'm kind of playing devil's advocate what what do you sort of make uh to about that argument how do you in your experiences have responded yeah like w what do you do with that because i wanted to sort of slowly wrap up but yeah so what do you do with that argument um kavita and promise okay um yeah still gathering my thoughts but yeah i think uh my response to this and again uh my response to this isn't you know very original i think this has been made by you know very many thinkers and movement activists throughout history and the left too is that you know if the left doesn't take the initiative to critically reflect on our own history, our past and our present and our mistakes and errors, right? We're going to repeat the same mistakes in the future. And if we genuinely want to transform society, transform reality, right? And build a better world, then we need to actually take ownership, right? And account for those mistakes because we don't do it. The right wing is going to do it. Right. And, you know, socialism or barbarism. And this is precisely, and it's about, what it means to have these know when to draw the line, you know, when movements have it turned, you know, all the way into the right for, for things we shouldn't support. I think the left should be critical and be reflective of when, um, you know, certain movements or regimes are unsalvageable, right? And that we need to rebuild again. Um, and, you know, about the, the, the question of, you know, this is not the time to critique, then there's never a right time to critique, right? You know, again, the, the question of, of China is like, you know, the U or a question of just U.S. versus any um, country it demonizes, right? It's always going to take advantage of unrests to try to, you know, do regime change or whatever to stir up things against the regime and promote its own agenda. That risk is always going to be there. And the logical conclusion of the campus' argument is that we don't do anything, is that we have no praxis, right? No plan for revolution, for solidarity, and that to me is completely right anti-internationalist right and that um we actually need to find ways in which to best empower the existing movements that are happening on the ground because while people in the left, western left are busy right sitting there in action there are existing movements happening right again there are people already doing stuff on the ground the goal the the, the task for the western left isn't to say like to judge whether this is the right timing or not to support these struggles is to look at how we can support these struggles in the best way possible so as to not you know reproduce western imperialist rhetoric while at the same time empowering these struggles to actually take power to challenge power uh on their own right uh and together with us and you know again this this rhetoric of you know now is not the time now is not the time to critique has historically bred room for disaster among the left right this is a classic stalinist tactic right it's it's oh there's west the threat of western capitalism we can't talk about our internal errors right the logical conclusion of, of that is that anyone who raises the inter these internal errors if we don't have a culture of actually healthily talking through them are going to be cast as you know enemies of the state of, of capitalist rotors blah blah, blah and right excluded killed murder whatever you call it right and we'll be using exactly the same mistakes that we've seen in the 20th century 
And why would we want to do that as the left, right? Again, going back to the, you know, the left needs a balance sheet of our failures and mistakes of the past, right? And also our successes, right? And to choose very carefully what we should keep amplifying, extending, and what we should drop and forget and leave, right, in the dustbin of history. And so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at, 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 at that. Well, I think that in India, the, you know, uh, it has been really hard for me. Uh, and I'm still in the process of trying to understand why there was so much hostility, even on the best of the Indian left, to really, um, you know, uh, take what should have been an intuitively, you know, perfectly normal position of solidarity for, uh, you know, Syria, Ukraine, you know, people's movements, basically, or the one in China now, without, uh, you know, ifs and buts and all kinds of, you know, strange calculations. And uh, my, you know, tentatively, what I would say is that in the first place, um, I think the, you know, the barrier, and I don't know how to get around that barrier yet, uh, is on two counts. One is that uh, the left itself is really not, uh, not comfortable in confronting the history of Ukraine in particular, because that would mean having to confront in specific details, the legacy of Stalinism. And while, uh, you know, parts of the left, like the party I was with, will say, oh, we do not defend, uh, you know, Stalin's crimes uh, or what they call mistakes. But, uh, you know, the idea is that when you, you know, there's no willingness to discuss which mistakes, what are you calling the mistakes? How big were those mistakes? Who did those mistakes, uh, you know, uh, who were the victims of those mistakes? You know, this is not about, you know, uh, your relationship with uh, Stalin's uh, history or whatever. This is about what happened to uh, people who were harmed by those uh, policies and decisions and crimes, right? Likewise in China now that, you know, the left is going to, and the party I was with, they just carried a long sort of critique of the Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, latest uh, Party Congress document. And yeah, it, it says a lot of things about human rights violations and this and that, all of that. But the point is, what's the conclusion? The concluding uh, sentences, the concluding line is, oh, you know, China is uh, moving away from socialism and is growing into a capitalism. And, you know, there's a sarcastic line about capitalism with Chinese characteristics. What does that mean? You know, um, it, it, it really, it is not about your assessment about how socialist or not socialist it is that's your problem what you should be worrying about is what happens to the people who are affected by this regime how socialist you think or it isn't is really it's like talking about how many angels on the uh, you know can dance on the end of a pin that is neither here nor there where is uh, your assessment of uh, the harm that is done, what can you do to support those people harmed by this regime? So I think, to, and it's not just inside China, right? Uh, you know, if you look at uh, Myanmar, I mean, the fact that China is <laughs> is uh, funding a Myanmar military, it is enabling the Myanmar military, that in India, you know, Islamophobia in India is buoyed up by the fact that you have it in Myanmar, you have it in China. You know, those who talk about geopolitics, how can you not look at this in terms of geopolitics? That is it a coincidence that you have so many regimes in this neighborhood are being actively Islamophobic? Uh, is there no connection between them? Can you find no way of thinking about this beyond your specific national place? I think these are the questions that we need to ask. And the only thing I would think would be helpful would be if there could be this, you know, we are talking here today, but I'm wondering what would uh, happen if you could bring onto the conversation people who are, you know, good faith people. Uh, let's not, let's not bring on the really outright bad faith Vijay Prashads and so on, but maybe someone who is, um, who, you know, those who are in a more honest place but are taking these positions and imagining that these are the correct positions. What if we were to bring them into a con I have failed inside India to bring them inside this conversation. But I think that if there was an attempt on part of, you know, people um, thinking about this beyond India, 
to come and say, look, we want to hear from you about your struggles that you are very legitimately waging in India. And then beyond that, we would also like to, you know, speak to you about how you see those struggles in connection with the world. We are reading things you've written. We have some questions about them. And we can have a civil sort of conversation about this, which may move the needle forward a little bit. That's the only thing I can think of which may help uh, to, you know, dislodge this uh, really damaging kind of place in which the left is stuck here. And, and I say this because, you know, I say this because just one last thing is because in the global south and in India specifically, as I said before, uh, you can't, you know, um, my Trotsky's friends in other countries say, oh, you know, Stalinist parties. But the point is that these are not obsolete parties. These are parties that are very much leading very important struggles and very genuine struggles that you can support, you know, without, uh, you know, so uh, you have to take them seriously. You can't just write them off as being, you know, outright, uh, whatever, you know, uh, policy parties that are so obsolete that they don't count. Which is why I think that, you know, you have to think about how to, how to reach out to them, how to make them think about what they're saying. Yeah. Sorry. No, thanks a lot for that. I think this is a, a, or sorry, like a, in my view, like hopeful note to, to end this fascinating conversation. So let me, um, ask what I usually ask all guests, uh, which is like, is, is there a book that you would recommend to our listeners on any topic? that sort of inspires you that you would like folks to to read and if if so you know which book that which book is that yeah. um i thought that i would like people to know more about uh, what's happening in india and uh, uh, you know specifically acquaint themselves with the uh, turn towards majoritarian or uh, you know far right fascist poli hindu hindu supremacist politics basically in india so the good book on that, which I would recommend, is one that came out in 2019. It's called The Majoritarian State. And it is um, edited by Angana Chatterjee, uh, Thomas Blom Hansen, and uh, Christopher, uh, Christoph Jaffernot. So I think that that's a good volume to start with. And the other you know, small thing, not a book, I'll say that if anyone is interested in sort of regular updates and short updates on what's happening in India, uh, please go to www.theindiacable. Uh, uh, I think it's dot com. I'm not sure, but it's basically the India Cable, and uh, that's some very good journalists from India who put together these little capsules of stuff. Uh, you know, which uh, anyone interested in India can easily easily read and keep up on. Yeah, um, the one book I recommend, uh, which yeah features. Um... I think, yeah, prominently in my framework and my specter piece about multipolarity is, is one of money power and financial capital and merging markets by Elias Alami, who is a political economist. Um, I think the book's a good example of, of this kind of new wave of, of, you know, academic studies, which I think, you know, uh, you know, we as organizers, uh, can translate more into, you know, activists and organizing spaces is, uh, you know, this new wave of, of academic studies tracking the new, rises and permutations of how state capitalisms work, state capitalism in the plural, right, in different forms, and, you know, how, you know, the the rise of new global financial actors, right, and being a central driver of global capitalism actually doesn't mean that states are becoming less powerful. Uh, it's actually looking at how states are becoming more powerful in the sense of helping to regulate and facilitate uh, finance and capital, oppressing, you know, uh, labor movements and, and stuff like that. Um, so the state is getting more powerful at the same time. New permutations of global finance is also being more powerful. I think, yeah, uh, Alami's book is a great, great example of, of of this kind of developing discourse, which I think is is uh, would be useful for you know people thinking about international politics and movements of resistance. All the, I mean, as I said uh, at the beginning of this conversation, there was a risk that Romeo's uh, power would go out. We knew this was this might be a risk. I'm kind of thankful that he managed to stay along for most of the conversation anyway. But I guess it's a good reminder of the, uh, in many ways, what we were talking about, like the consequences or the, the realities are just not the same. And folks who do have power right now uh, should think of the implications for folks like Romeo with their position. So again, all this, all that's left really is for 
me to thank you too for coming on. This was honestly a fantastic chat and I'm sure we'll do something again at some point uh, soon. So thanks a lot. Thank you. It was great uh, meeting everyone here, at least virtually and uh, absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much.